Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Book Club of California's online program titled The Sugar King of California. And thank you for joining us for this Book Club of California presentation. My name is Kevin Kosick, and I'm the executive director of the Book Club of California, and it's my pleasure to welcome you and host this webinar. Now, for those of you who are new to the Book Club of California, the Book Club of California is a nonprofit member and donor supported organization that is dedicated to preserving and promoting the history of the book and the book arts. Oftentimes we do that with a focus on the literature and the history of California and the West. The Book Club publishes limited edition books, a scholarly journal, and keepsakes. We also host a year round series of exhibitions and programs like the one this evening on topics including fine printing, design, typography, book binding, collecting, California history, of course, and much, much more. Now, if you're not a member of the book club or if your membership has lapsed and you're interested in what we do, please consider joining our century long tradition. Our membership dues are modest, but the benefits are many, and we simply can't do the work of the book club without the support of our members. So I encourage you to visit us online at bccbooks.org to join or to donate or to just find out more about the Book Club of California. And now for tonight's program and our presenter. The program is titled The Sugar King of California and our presenter is Sandra E. Bonora. Historian Dr. Sandra E. Bonora likes to be called Sandy. Yes, I do. <laughs> She's a retired professor who is actually busy on her second career resurrecting the forgotten stories of overlooked historical figures. She has written extensively on notable Hawaiians for the Hawaiian Journal of History and published two books with the University of Hawaii Press. Light in the Queen's Garden, Ida Mae Pope, a pioneer for Hawaii's daughters, which was published in 2017, and An American Girl in the Hawaiian Islands, The Letters of Carrie Prudence Winter, 1890 to 1893, which was published in 2012. Uh, the University of Nebraska Press published Empire Builder, John D. Spreckles and the Making of San Diego in 2020, and this year, they published her latest book titled The Sugar King of California, The Life of Klaus Spreckles, which is the subject of her talk this evening. Now, Klaus Spreckles was a once prominent but now nearly forgotten sugar baron and the kingpin in the development of the Hawaii, California sugarcane industry. Sandy will talk about the life and the career of one of the richest Americans in history, a man who wielded unrivaled power and political influence. Now, in terms of logistics, uh, tonight's program will include this presentation by Sandy and then a Q&A session. If you have questions or comments for our presenter or about the presentation, you can use the chat and the Q&A functions in Zoom. We should have time at the end of the hour to take questions and we'll curate those from both the chat and the Q&A. Um, I am going to stay on camera for this presentation so Sandy has somebody to perform to, someone to talk to <laughs> dur during her presentation. So I hope I won't be distracting to you folks, but we'll both stay on camera. You can change the size of uh, the panel, uh, which shows the presentation, the PowerPoint presentation, or the, it, the tiles that show our faces, if you like. You should be able to just click on that little bar between and drag um, to change the size if you'd like. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Sandy Benora. Sandy, it's all yours. All right. Well, it's up to you whether you're going to be distracting or not, Kevin. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. I'm in San Diego, and I can't get rid of this ocean behind me. So <laughs> I wish this were San Diego, but it is Hawaii. You know, as Kevin said in those comments section, if you have any personal affiliation to the Spreckles family or their industry, your great grandfather grew beads or your great uncle worked for the Spreckles factory, things like that. I'd love to, I'd love to know you were here. So please put a comment. 
All right, you've had a long time to look at this slide and we're gonna get going. And I should tell you, you're gonna be doing a little bit of reading. So um, be, keep, your, keep your eyes on the slides as well. Here we go. Now, clearly we don't have time to go through 19 chapters of my book. But you're going to look and look here and see how meaty this book is. My publisher was screaming at me to reduce the content. Do I know how much paper costs these days? And I said, well, you, okay, you, you go ahead and uh, decide what you can cut. This man was larger than life. I had no idea that this book could be 600 pages. It's 400. Anyways, it's it's huge. Uh, this man, um, you're going to find out. So have a little look at the chapter titles. And as you can see, this is more than your typical Horatio Alger rags to riches story. It's also a portrait of a family torn apart by money, jealousy, and ego. And there are lessons for all of us here. Meet Klaus on the left, his wife, Anna. His five children are below, and you're going to be meeting just a little bit, all of them. Well, let's look at Klaus. The reason I have a Havana cigar up there, because uh, you'd be hard-pressed to find a period photo of the man without a cigar in his hand. He loved Havanas, but you're also going to learn he was a logistical genius way, way, way ahead of his time. You're going to be blown away. So don't just think sugar. Think bigger. Um, Kevin, do you hear this tapping noise? Okay. No. Um, this book that you're seeing right here is the book that preceded Klaus, Klaus's book. This is his son. I am hearing a lot of tapping. It's really strange. Okay, it's done. Nope, it's back. Okay, I'm sorry, everybody. There is a, like, someone has got some clogging shoes unless I keep my mouse on the little frame. I don't know what to do about that. Uh-oh. Oh, dear. Okay, I don't know what to do about it. But these are, when, when, I want you to know how I got, how I got interested in telling Klaus's story because I live in San Diego. I'm a born, I was born and raised here, named after Okay, Kevin, I'm going to have to do something. I'm going to have to. Yeah, we're we're not hearing it, so I don't I don't know what you're hearing there. I'm not hearing any tapping or other sounds. Wow. Okay, this is very strange. Anyway, so I'm going to do, do the best I can to just know that I am hearing constant tapping. Um, that's the book, Empire Builder. These are the chapters. John D. Spreckles was the father of infrastructure and superstructure in San Diego. There's just no other way. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, everybody. Okay, let's go meet Klaus for a second. Klaus was born in what, what is today Germany, but what was then Hanover in the Northern um, part of Germany as we know it, the kingdom of Prussia to be exact, and this little village called Landstead. And Everybody, when they got to be about 17, and if you were a male, you were thinking, how were you going to get out of there? Because there was a draft. You would be drafted. You would be going to war. There is no way out. So at the age of 17, our Klaus um, picked up, despite protests from his parents and his Lutheran minister, and he went to America. Now, once you look at this picture right here, this isn't your typical place where immigrants uh, left uh, and arrived in America. Now look, this is Charleston, South Carolina. That's where that is. That's where he headed. And he didn't go to a farm. He was a farmer. He came from a very poor family, not just a poor family of farmers. They were tenant farmers, which means they didn't even own the land they farmed on. So we're talking about um, an, an amazing accomplishment when this little poor kid um, arrives in, in Charleston, South Carolina with 75 cents in his pocket and becomes one of the richest men in the world. And hopefully you'll see a little bit of his character in this slideshow today. 
His sweetheart, Anna Mangles, in the neighboring village uh, followed followed Klaus there and they began a married life there. Oh dear, uh-oh. Do you see that? What's May I ask you what's happening on your end right now, people? Yeah, we're getting a blank slide after this slide. I, mine is just flashing. No, so. Can we exit and come back in? Yeah, do you want to do that? Go ahead. I don't know any other way. Oh, let me just start this. Maybe it'll come out. Nope. Oh, fingers crossed. Fingers <laughs> crossed. Okay. When he uh, when he arrived in us uh, Charleston, South Carolina, um, he was uh oh, blank slide. Yeah, okay. it's do it's doing it again. Um, okay. Maybe Thanks. maybe maybe you can just show it from there. Oh, you, do you have something on your keyboard? It looks like. Okay, I'm going to have to go back in and share screen. I'm, I'm so sorry. The whole thing just, I've never had this happen. Okay, everybody gets a free book. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. You're, you're, you're still, you're sharing your screen still. Okay. So we're seeing your Zoom screen now. I'm so if you want to, if you want to do the stop share. And launch over. You can do that. Thank there you. you go. Now, now it's just us, and then do share oh, again. Thank you. It's the ghost of Klaus. Oh. <laughs> that's, that's what someone that that's what Daria put in the in the yeah. chat. It's, Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> so that's so now you want to, you can close this window at, or move it aside so you can get to your PowerPoint. There you go. And now it's right in the middle there. That was weird. Let's see if we can do this again. Okay, I'm going to share screen. Uh, okay. Good news. That clogging sound is gone. Good grief. Anyways, here we are. We're back to, to Charleston, South Carolina. Part of the mission for me to write stories are then to find the descendants. And you're looking at a descendant of Klaus Spreckles right down below. Last year, she went to college in South Carolina, and I gave her the address of Klaus's first store. And by the way, her great, great, great grandfather was born on the top floor. One of the beautiful things about being a researcher in this century is I can contact the University of South Carolina and find a digitized um, photo of the exact place where Klaus Spreckles began uh, his life in America. It's pretty exciting. Well, he had to get out of uh, South Carolina people because you'll see the exact citation that he was given. You just were not gonna have any blacks buying liquor or loitering around your store. He could not believe it. But they were gonna put him in jail, fine him or both. But he got out of Dodge. He went to San Francisco right after the gold rush. Now, if you look at the map on, on uh, the left of the screen right there, um, it's gonna say the Panama Canal, but you and I both know the Panama Canal was not yet there. It was the Isthmus, and that's how our efficient Klaus decided he was going to go to San Francisco. Now, maybe some of you are wondering what it took to go on a ship from New York around the Cape Horn all the way to San Francisco. That could take six months, you know, weather permitting. The Isthmus was, you know, it wasn't any sure thing either, but it was the stories of those who went that way are horrific. And the fact that Klaus had a little baby by this time and a, and a little toddler and a wife and he chose to go this way, well, he was just efficient. And when Klaus Spreckles made up his mind to do anything, he's doing it. Pretty cool is that that uh, rendering of San Francisco, 1855, because friends, this is exactly how it must have looked when Klaus arrived. And um, here's a picture of Klaus in the middle and John D. Spreckles, the pioneer of my city, San Diego, and his uh, other son, Adolf, um, who you'll learn more about. They did have 12 children, but um, it's tragically, seven of them died from a myriad of childhood diseases. Very, very tragic. I go in depth in, in, in the book. 
you'll see some of the decisions made, Klaus made along the way um, were uh, surrounding um, the death of another child. Terribly, it's just heartbreaking. Um, so went to San Francisco, hey, same business, but on the opposite coast. He knows, he knows dry good grocery because that's what he's been doing. Would you please look how sugar used to come to hit the dry markets? I mean, that is a sticky, gobby mess. Those are sugar nippers on the tray. And you would use that nipper to, to whatever the customer says, it want a little bit. This is probably for home use at the time because it's so small. But Klaus was blown away that everybody in America um, stirred sugar in their coffee that was refined from cane. Because every single person in Europe stirred coffee in there, stirred sugar in their coffee, refined from beets. And when I do this, this presentation in person, I bring beet sugar and I bring cane sugar. And I call up someone from the audience to come and tell me, what do you, what do you know? Is it how different? Nobody has ever said they, there's a difference. So it truly is miraculous that beet sugar and cane sugar are identical in every way. Um, and you should know um, sugar, if you could get it, was a household luxury. Look down at the bottom down there. See those big cones? That's how sugar used to be manufactured. It was a long, long process to get your sugar cane to look like this to go to market. Now, Louisiana grew it and unfortunately fueled the horrible slave trade and New York refined it. When the Civil War happened, well, they weren't talking, were they? So if they weren't talking, the South and the North, you can imagine in California, if you had sugar, you locked it up. And that's an actual sugar box from the Smithsonian. Didn't last long uh, being a shopkeeper. He had big ideas. Big ideas were going like, around like crazy in San Francisco at this time, post gold rush. He founded a brewery, the Albany Brewery where my friends, I'm here to inform you, he founded Steam Ale. It was not Anchor, it was Klaus Spreckles, and you'll read all about that. He then, he was so successful with his cream ales and lagers that he opened up a bar. And uh, that's fun, you'll, there's a lot of stories. I'm a real storyteller in the book. So there's a lot of anecdotal stories about what was going on in San Francisco during this time with breweries. But where he founded this was providentially founded next to a working sugar refinery. And the workers used to sit and nurse their beers at night and talk trash about the owner. And that got him to think, I want to be a sugar refiner. There is money in it. So tells Anna, his wife, honey, pack my steam trunk. I'm going to New York to learn sugar refining. And by the way, pack John's trunk. He's nine years old. He's coming with me. I can just imagine his, his wife going, what? You're not taking my nine-year-old. Why are you going, Klaus? But off he went. And you know the route he had to take with his son to go learn to be a sugar refiner. And by the way, after this trip, he never, ever, ever was separated from Anna and the family again. Where he went, they went. So this must have been a horrific separation for him. So he learned it well. Many stories in the book about that. I love, I, I just can't believe how dangerous sugar refining was. I had no idea, but horrific. Once he learns the trade, learns the trade, comes back to San Francisco, finds a couple of guys to go into business with. And he, because Klaus did everything, go big or go home, he had the most successful sugar refinery, virtually, you know, putting his competition next to his former brewery, you know, on their, you know, begging because they just couldn't keep up. So they were barely surviving. Um, and when he told his partners, hey, let's put our dividends back into the company and start expanding. They're like, ah, 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 ah. Slow it down, Klaus. We like San Francisco. We want to chill out a little bit. Uh, don't be so ambitious. Well, telling Klaus not to be ambitious, uh, that just didn't work. The, the falling out with his partners made every newspaper in San Francisco and Sacramento, it was that 
It was that bad. And just for context, um, that four-year horrible war that took 700,000 of our men was over. Lee surrendered. I mean, the, the country was in just in euphoria until five days later, President Abraham Lincoln was shot and killed. I mean, this is the context during the time. Really chaotic. And he decided he's going to go back to Germany. He's going to learn how to refine beets. He already knows how to refine cane. Let me go get beets. And I'm going to come back. And I don't have to worry about where the cane comes from, Louisiana, because I'm going to get California farmers to farm them. And I'm going to refine them. And off I go. Well, um, spoiler alert, he checks into a, uh, he has a nervous breakdown along the way and ends up in one of those beautiful little bottom bottom spas. But <laughs> anyways, great stories about those spas in, in uh, Germany. When you have a breakdown, I'm not sure you want to go there. Anyways, he uh, comes back two years. He's ready to refine. He has learned his stuff. He's even recruited. He, he went as a common laborer, mind you, you know, he undercover. He didn't tell them he was coming there to um to take away their business and in, in america he he you know he went there to learn the trade and he labored to do it that's how he learned everything as a common laborer so the thing of it is he could not succeed in california at this time it was too expensive for farmers california farmers during this time were can i say impoverished that might be putting it very light. They could, you know, they could, one man could tend a wheat field, but it needed 40 to tend to the same acreage planted in these complicated beets. It took a lot. So Klaus did what Klaus had to do. He pivoted and he went back to refining cane. He put those beet seeds in his pocket for another day and he founded, remember, go big or go home, the largest sugar refinery in the world. So look who is vice president of his new company, his 14 year old son, and whose secretary managing the books, his 11 year old son, Adolf. So um, there you go. Uh, there's going to be never any outsiders um, in management for his company. You would have your vision. And he was, he, when he went to Germany, he either bought a patent, I never could find this at, or he invented it. But he came back and now he could make sugar in a day, which used to take weeks. And he gave powdered sugar, crushed sugar, and hello, he gave America the sugar cube. I mean, can you imagine the uh, what people used to do? And here comes this man. Klaus Spreckles is a household name at this point. If you were his son, you were in sugar. You had no choice. It was all work and no play. You got your John, Adolf, and Gus. There was another son, uh, Rudolf, who's too young at this point, and another daughter, his only baby daughter, Emma, who he doted on, who never had to lift a finger, who had a bevy of servants around her at all times, <laughs> and uh, which meant she got a little overweight. Anyways, uh, here we go. Let's you've met the boys here. You can see a little bit of their characteristics I've typed underneath. Gus here is like his father. They used to call him um, sugar in his blood, Gus. So this is Soma. This is where he began buying up blocks and blocks of real estate because he was going to create a home away from home for himself, all his relatives from Germany, his wife's relatives, everyone's pouring over to the south of market. Uh, they've got homes and reading the journals of all three sons and letters. This was the happiest times of their life. They had cousins up and down the street. Um, it was just, Klaus was walking through the streets, cigar in hand, talking in German where he could, patting his workers on the back, greeting relatives, a good time. All the stress and, con and congestion of San Francisco um, required that he gets a summer home outside of there at Anna's urging because he's had a couple of nervous breakdowns. He's doing too much, too fast. 
Um, I can relate to Klaus. I'm usually going that way too. And I have to go, don't be Klaus. Anyways, at that time, uh, he found Aptos, a whole great story in the book about how he discovers Aptos, and um, which was then a two-day stagecoach trip, because you're not going to Santa Cruz area from San Francisco any other way. And it was grueling. So um, anyway, partners with Frederick Heen, anybody here from um, Santa Monica knows that name. Um, Frederick Heen is probably the most important pioneer of Santa Cruz and Capitola and uh, another German immigrant. They partner and they build the Santa Cruz Railroad, which was amazing. Today, the one of the engines is in the Smithsonian's, Smithsonian's uh, Museum. And there it is right there for you train buffs. He built a beautiful summer house. You can see the black and white on the right. Uh, there's another one still still standing in 1876. There's a picture of me with some with a group in front of it. So there you go. And they have a train because they decided he's going to build a resort. Um, Frederick Keene's going to build Capitola. He's going to build the Aptos Resort. And the train's going to stop right in front. And there's this incredible resort Klaus Spreckles built. It was, this is what it looks like in the inset down here today. That's Aptos Beach. But all this with polo grounds, I mean, it was magical by all accounts. And uh, this is how John D, the Hotel del Coronado here in San Diego, was very much inspired by John D, the owner of this hotel, of the Hotel Dell, by this experience with his father. But during this time, troublesome news arose. Can I give you just a second to look at the screen, please? I'm all watered up. So friends, this was a big deal. America wanted Pearl Harbor. It would, you know, we, didn't, we couldn't buy it, of course, because Hawaii was a monarchy ruled, reigned and ruled by a king, David Kalakaua. And America says, hey, Hawaii, we're going to let all your sugar come in free, tax free. Just think of the money you're going to make if you license Pearl Harbor to us. And of course, David Kalakaua was very much in favor of that. But guess who fought it? He threw every bit of money he could at it. Kyle Spreckles did. And uh, the congressmen, you should, you'll should you read in the book, if, should you decide to read it, what they were saying about Klaus Spreckles at this time. I mean, come on, he was a household name in California and, you know, a little out the West, but now Washington D.C. Who is this man with all this power who can stop a reciprocity treaty from going forward with the Kingdom of Hawaii? It took one year. And in Hawaii, they were like, who the heck is Spreckles? Oh my gosh, he's costing us money every day. This thing's not signed. But Kong, but to Congress, Klaus argued, why should those disloyal Americans be rewarded over loyal and hardworking Americans? He considered the disloyal Americans in Hawaii, this group on the right here. That was Hawaii's sugar industry. They weren't Hawaiians. They were the descendants. They were the sons and the grandsons and the nephews of that first company of well-meaning missionaries, mostly well-meaning, that's on a side for me. They were running the economy, all the businesses. They planted every single bit of arable land across all islands in sugar cane. They were running, running Hawaii, and they sat on the Hawaiian government, keeping King Kalakaua in check, because these were congregationalist missionaries, very prudish, and they told they would not allow the king to resurrect the hula. Hey, no hula, that's lewd, and so forth and so on. There's more to that story. But they kept the king in check, and it really frustrated the king. Um until uh, one day in San Francisco, one of the sugar agents uh, from Hawaii showed up to tell Spreckles, Spreckles, I'm here in San Francisco to tell you 
You better reverse your stand or you're not buying any more of our sugar cane again. And Klaus, quite frankly, needed that sugar cane. But I think, but anyway, see, um, let me tell you what an agent is real quick. A sugar agent was a missionary. A sugar planter was a missionary. I'm calling them all missionaries at this point. The agent would, hey, hey, brother, a uh, planter, you're having a bad year. Let me lend you some money. Let me market your sugar. Oh, you need a piece of machinery? Let me buy that machinery. Let me take care of you. I'm your agent. And they took a huge commission, which, you know, was oftentimes caused problems between the two of them. But anyways, Klaus informed Congress, hey, I have reversed my position. Get the treaty. Let it go. So President Grant was super excited. The treaty was ratified. There was no underground cable to let Hawaii know. A congressman actually had to jump on a ship, a slow moving ship to tell that was not regular to tell the King of Hawaii the treaty was finally in effect. Well, guess who jumped on the ship too before anybody in America knew that that treaty was now gonna be in action any of the sugar people in New York, for example, or anyone in Hawaii would know, he and his son, John, over three weeks, branched out, secured all future sugarcane contracts from the plantations before anybody knew what was going on. So in other words, the planters didn't need to pay the agents. Hey, they, they, they cut deals. They gave them so much money. And when the sugar planters realized they were cut out by this interloper, this outsider, this Klaus Spreckles, their hatred of all things Spreckles began in earnest. On the way home, Klaus himself said, I have a big plan. I can't stop it. I love that Hawaii. And I saw some archaic practices. I've got, you know, agriculture in my blood. I could, I could build a sugarcane plantation if I could only just get some water to it. So that's one of my favorite stories about how he, he built all this up. Anyways, this is called the Isthmus where my mouse is going up and down. This is dry and arid Maui. No water. But Haleaka Crater, Haleakala Crater, which some of you I'm sure have taken a bike tour down, has lots of water. So he had to divert the water by a series of really sophisticated plumes and they just called the ditch down to the isthmus. So anyways, this is where in Hawaii, the controversy of Klaus Spreckles is just, I mean, I, I don't know what they're thinking now. The book is brand new, but they're gonna see this in context, but he got a thousands of acres, which were actually crown lands, which nobody, if you weren't royalty, uh, could own, but he ended up owning it. And um, anyways, um, crazy stuff in this book. I, so you can see uh, why he is either saint or sinner in Hawaii today. He is German water engineer, surveyed the slopes of Haleakala, and then he submitted an application to the monarchy. Here's my survey. Here's my water rights. I know what the reciprocity treaty says. You've got to approve it. Uh, and by the way, I've already spent thousands of dollars on eight, on land, so I've got to make this work. But guess what? Didn't happen. Researchers in Hawaii, um, gosh, way back in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, are still talking about the midnight deal that Klaus Spreckles made with the king of Hawaii. When that application was denied, and it was denied, friends, by the people sitting on the cabinet who are also sugar agents. Oh, well, you cost us a um, commission for the next two years. So no, you're denied. We need you out of Hawaii. Well, he was, he frantically um, knew he had one night to get that reversed. So <laughs> there's a big, okay, it's a Hawaiian hotel. It includes lots of lobster and champagne. And Klaus Spreckles invited the king to a private party. Very interesting. Lots of money changed hands. $10,000 personal loan to the king. Many more tens of thousands to the Hawaiian government as a nice loan with low interest. So at midnight, both of them, I'm sure Klaus, uh, the king was more inebriated than Klaus. He had a little bit of a drinking problem, bless his heart. And um, they create a memo 
and a royal messenger went and knocked on the door at 1.30 in the morning, uh, informing those cabinet members, by the way, you're fired, don't show up the next day. And that very next day, a new cabinet granted Klaus water privileges for 30 years. Powerful, powerful move. Now, some of you may have gone into your family's business because that's the family business. That's what the boys had to do in the sugar industry. But John didn't like sugar. He loved shipping and boats and water. He was a Commodore. He, was, he sailed yachts. He won races. And he said to his dad, Dad, why should somebody else, horrible ships, and don't even leave at time, take your sugar crops from his beautiful plantation. He's he's now developed the largest plantation in Hawaii, um, in the world, by the way. Um, he says, let me develop a shipping company. Now, mind you, in 1883, our John, the eldest son, was only 26 years old. And he supervises the building of these gorgeous steamships. And by 1890, he has seven of them. He's breaking records. Hawaii is no longer a, a place where, you know, you read in books that cannibals ate, ate people. This is a place where you and I could go, where the mail could go regular. I mean, it's a huge, huge thing that John D. Spreck was convinced his dad to invest in him. And they began the Oceanic Steamship Company, the very, very first steamship company to go into the Pacific carrying the American flag. And those of you who are shipping pros, it was not Matson. Matson worked for Spreckles. And um, let's see what else I want to say with this. Every time a ship came, the, the royal family sent out the royal band to, you know, play beautiful music as it sailed away, lay around everyone's necks because this was a big deal. You're getting news from around the world at this point. So now we have vertical integrations. Spreckles family, they're growing their sugar. They're their own agents. They're transporting their own sugar. They're refining their sugar. They're distributing their sugar. Think how far ahead they were. Okay, I want you all to think right now of Starbucks. Starbucks has a nice vertical integration. Billionaires, just like Spreckles in his day. Way ahead. Think of Apple as well. So here we go. Now he was bringing technology to Hawaii the likes of nobody has seen before. If you think that the White House didn't get electricity until 1891, and Klaus took electricity to that plantation in 1885. I mean, are you as impressed as I am? I mean, this is big deal. And oh, let me, let me build another railroad, says Klaus. There it is, it's on display. And at the Maui plantation, you can see one of the little engines. Uh, always his engines are called the Klaus Spreckles. Um, so anyways, he began experimenting. He brought steam plows, which the royal family called big puffy monsters. They'd never seen anything like it. So you didn't need all those hard laborers because now, you know, we can save the backs of men. We can use this railroading technology. With all these millions pouring into the king, just as as you know, as the United States anticipated, they had no idea that only one man in America would benefit from it. His name would be Klaus Spreckles. Money was pouring into the kingdom of Hawaii, and King Kalakaua decides to go on a spending spree. He went around the globe. That was very expensive. And once he visited um, London, England, and went to, you know, was greeted as a fellow monarch, he wanted to come back and build himself. A castle, excuse me, a castle, um, a palace. And here it is. This is the Iolani Palace right here. Built, he says, I built a palace. And if you got a palace, you got to have some solid gold crowns in here. It's all gold. And by the way, I'm going to throw myself a coronation. And by the way, because all this money came into my kingdom and we're actually elevating ourselves with some infrastructure, I'm going to knight Klaus Spreckles. So our Klaus Spreckles became Sir Klaus. Guess who hated Klaus Spreckles? Uh, the Howleys running the government because now the king is out of control and the Hawaiians are getting upset too. They're watching this king spend so 
much money. He is indiscriminately spending everywhere in their eyes and no one seemed to stop him. Even Klaus said, you know what, King, you need to cool it a bit. Great stories in the book around this time. <clears throat> Once, here, let me let's let you read this for a second, please. Now, uh, please meet Michael DeYoung. He provided daily entertainment with the San Francisco Chronicle, which is really a tabloid uh, style journalist in that day. His brother Charles had already been shot and killed for tabloid style stories. Uh, the paper was, in his words, for sale. And boy, he hated Klaus Spreckles and Klaus Spreckles hated him. And he belittled, once you know, Klaus Spreckles was Sir Claus. Uh, oh, he couldn't, He this. these are some of the words he used in the newspaper, Lord Sugar Barrel. Oh, he made him so mad. But when he started making these inflammatory lies, and they were later proven to be lies, 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 these ones on the right-hand side, well, Adolf, oh, purportedly defending his father's honor, shot de Young. Actually, he shot him three times. So he's a real bad shot because Michael de Young lived. And he was acquitted. I never laughed so hard in my life. I remember my husband coming running down the hall. Why are you laughing? What's up? Reading the transcript of this trial is hysterical. I break it down nicely in the book. I can't believe what the, what the Spreckles lawyers did to get Adolf Spreckles off of attempted murder with nothing more than a headache. Oh, it's, it's good stuff. This is just a little paragraph from my book. This news, by the way, made worldwide news. And it's like, you can do anything in San Francisco, apparently. It is the wild, wild west. You can, you can shoot the editor of a newspaper and get off with a headache. Anyways, this is a complicated slide. Nobody has time to go through this. But if you want to know exactly how America got hold of the Hawaiian Islands once and for all, this book will tell you. I've been studying Hawaiian history and America's role in it from primary source documents for a lot of years. And um, now I get to put King Spreckles right in the middle of it because that's what they were calling him. The Howleys started calling him to, to, get the, to get negative press against them. Hey, Hawaiian, Native Hawaiians, who's your real king? Is it King Spreckles or is it King Kalakaua? Well, on that left column, you'll see the king had to get away from Spreckles as much as he did not want to do it. And when and so it worked. Spreckles was back in San Francisco. He kept his everything in Hawaii. Of course, you know, that's making big money. But he was back in San Francisco to concentrate. And so it was now or never. Those Howleys, those, those missionary descendants, had to gain control over the king and the kingdom right now. And they made him, call him two, sign a bayonet constitution. That's what we call it today. Because the king said he feared for his life and they had a gun on him. That's never been corroborated. But King Calacao was signed. The I mean, he signed his rights away. I mean, he could now, after he put his signature on the con new constitution, uh, Dole drummed up, he could reign like, you know, King Charles is right now, uh, but he could not rule, um, not King Charles. Anyways, um, yeah, native land and voting rights were abolished by, it was just a horrible, horrible thing. He went to California for medical treatment he had Bright's disease. He was hoping to get cured. That's a, a liver ailment, by the way. Probably a lot of alcohol abuse. He was a the king was a wonderful progressive king. He just had a problem. And we talk about I talk about his problems. I introduce you in the book to King as a child because I have studied his childhood. And it's really sad. His and his sisters. When he died at the Palace Hotel in San Francisco, Klaus was by his side. And after he died, his sister, Queen Lilio Kalani, ascended the throne. And in her first act, oh, I am undoing what my stupid brother did. <clears throat> and so when she, draft, when she drafted a new constitution, they had to fight her. They had to, they had to get rid of her quick. 
and they did. The rest is history. She was charged with treason and imprisoned in her own palace. The queen could have, you know, unleashed an army on these few sugar planters, but she couldn't believe that the United States would support this. So she said, let's not have any bloodshed. The queen, Klaus returned immediately, said, queen, I'm going to give you a million dollars. You got to fight this. And there's a lot of ways this was did to help her. But um, they had to get rid of him. They did not want Klaus in Honolulu at all. So they put a death threat on his home in Honolulu, um, threatening his death, which actually did the trick. Klaus demanded police support. That's another whole big story. Leaves Honolulu, and the rest is history here. Back in San Francisco, I wish I could see your faces and ask you to raise your hand who lives here. I just I just feel so lonely, you know, doing a uh, webinar here. But um, um, some of you know that the call building somewhat exists today. Anyways, Klaus uh, put every all oh, millions into buying up real estate and he decided uh, to buy the San Francisco call. His son, John, was the managing editor of it. And they built the Call Building or the Klaus Spreckles Building. And there it is, this gorgeous, gorgeous building. Iconic from the moment it was built. It was white marble. It had a restaurant on top. A lot of the descendants today still have some of the knockers from the doors on that with the CS logo. I mean, a beautiful building, all lit up. This, the stories of this, of this building is it's incredible. People lined all the shores on the East Bay to watch it at light up at night for its first. It was pretty big news. So um, let me give you one more little cute story about um, <clears throat> the call building. You see the, on the, that arrow pointing down, that's a smokestack from the S SFG and E. This, this horrible um, power company had soot coming out of it and they were marring the sides of Klaus's buildings and the tenants were complaining. They're like, hello, we're paying all this money. Uh, there's smoke coming into our, our windows and Klaus is like, oh my gosh, you're marring my gorgeous, gorgeous building. And Joe Crockett did not return his calls. So he considered himself pretty fortunate one day when he was at the Pacific Union Club having lunch, he looks over and sees, ah, there's Joe Crockett. Let me get over there and tell him he better stop that soot. And those are the exact quotes we got. I mean, there was a lot of people present that recorded it for the newspapers the following day. So we can really, we know the story is, is, uh, is uh, almost verbatim. So when he said, hey, Crockett, when are you going to do something about the smoke from your powerhouses? He turned his back and humiliated Klaus by saying, Spreckles, I make it a practice not to business, not to discuss business at the club. Klaus was so humiliated, never used to anyone turn his back on him. Within two hours, he had his engineers, he had his lawyers, he had his bankers. We are putting that company out of business and we're throwing Crockett out to the, on the street, which is exactly what happened in a real great story. Uh, he, he built his own independent light and power. It was modern. People switched over it, bankrupt the other one. Um, he moved it to Potrero next to his refinery, it expanded. Um, and then with this point made for his marred building, he sold it and um, the merge became Pacific Gas and Electric, PG&E. He moves to Potrero, as I just mentioned. He now has, he's utilizing technology he's, that likes have never been seen. That's a ship coming in from Hawaii to unload. Um, I, the, the technology he does is, is like mind-boggling to me, but um, he is just literally building up all of Potrero, and um, he's only will use San Francisco. People who live local, he'll only hire you. I mean, we're in a horrible straight, dire straits um, at this during these years, and he will only hire local industries to work on any of his projects because he wanted California to succeed. And the governor said, you know what? Leave the man alone. Spreckle's success is always California's success. 
and everybody wanted to work for Klaus. They were so loyal to him. And let me just make the point. Some people may have called Klaus Freckles a robber baron. I don't think so. I mean, I don't, I know he was not. Robber barons were never liked by their employees, were they? They took over other industries uh, on hostile takeovers. They usually like Carnegie, they, they, the the um, workers hated them. He was loved, not only for the beer they got twice a day, they were well-paid and because Klaus lived the life of um, a refiner, he made sure it was safe. So a bunch of loyal employees, they stayed with him all their lives. He had a really good friendship with Levi Strauss, one German, one Jew, both the same age, both laboring at this point in time, 50 years together to make San Francisco the commercial capital of the West. They teamed up mostly because Levi Strauss did not have the money Klaus Spreckles did, but they wanted to develop a new railroad to compete against the PG&E. And that's exactly a, through a series of twists and turns they did. So now Klaus is building a third railroad called the People's Railroad, by the way, because now we're going all the way from Stockton down to Bakersfield. So the genes could go south, sugar could go south, but other farmers in all those countries can now cost efficiently get their goods to market in San Francisco without paying the exorbitant fees of the PG&E. PG&E, Southern Pacific, I meant folks, the SP. So Levi Strauss, Klaus Spreckles, heroes. Now, with the cable car invented, let's move up to Pacific Heights. And the reason Klaus moved up is he was very happy in his little modest house down there in the south of the market. But he had a daughter that had no suitors. And she was not very outgoing. And she was, you know, nobody had more money than Klaus. He was the richest man in California. So he built a mansion. Um, you'll see it on the right there. And look at the person walking in front of it. That's how incredibly large it is. He wanted San Francisco's richest men, young men to know, so look what you're going to get. This is my wife's, excuse me, my daughter's inheritance. So this house was really to showcase his daughter. Here's some of the photos of the interior of that house. Koa wood, rare Koa wood. Look at that shipping company. They had treasures from around the world. This is just two of the pictures. Now his baby girl, Emma, her bathroom cost today, in today's money, $340,000. Can you imagine that? Solid gold pipes. Pretty amazing house. But... Just think about this beautiful house he built for his daughter, Emma. Emma never moves in here. Hmm. Emma never comes. She eloped with an old guy who was poor. So she broke her father's heart. She moved to England, and his baby girl's gone. He began to um, realize, you know, to probably just suppress a lot of his grief. You know, he starts doing a lot of philanthropy in San Francisco. Uh, there's the, today's music concourse in San Francisco was the, was the music stand in that day. And he gave a speech on that day when he did this commissioned um, concourse for the city of San Francisco. They said there's tears running down his face because he just really just says, you know, California is the place. Whoever, whosoever works in California will never can go wrong. I mean, it's just a beautiful speech. This is just a portion of it. Now, those of you, if anybody um, knows San Diego, this is the Oregon Pavilion in Balboa Park here in my city. Like father, like son, John D. Spreckles gave this to to the, give on the right-hand side to San Diego, just like his father gave the left-hand side to San Francisco. That's just one of the ways. There's many, many parallels. And then this is the, the look up, uh, listen up, people. This is where the family falls apart. 
real looking at the time. Oh dear me, we're going to go fast. Let's just say the whole family broke down at this point um, because of the this Havemeyer, this trust organizer that Klaus refused to join, put his son in charge, Gus, and his young, young boy to build this refinery. And I'm telling you what, um, it was successful. And but after after just a couple of years, Klaus needed to get out, but he sold it to the enemy uh, when, the, when New York shut him down from trust, but he didn't tell Gus and that was his falling thing. And, and Gus was so brokenhearted that his dad would go behind his back. But you gotta know that Klaus uh, had a lot of reasons why that the book talks about. Gus published this letter in the newspaper saying his dad, you've broken my heart, I resign. Because Klaus, when it was sold, Adolf accused, accused his younger brother Gus of, of embezzling funds, which he never did. It was actually Adolf all along. So, oh my gosh, 15 years he wouldn't see his son because of this horrible thing. The three boys on one side and the two older brothers on the other side. And then that family, the two youngest boys, they sued their father. The father sued them for libel. Then they, the boys, unbelievably, you have to read this story. I can't go into it, but they gained and seized every bit of the holdings that Klaus Spreckles had built in Hawaii, plantation, the business, everything. And then the Howleys in charge of the Hawaiian um, doings over there, the sugar boys, I call them, but they outmaneuvered the Spreckles boys and everything slipped away. So it was a family divided. I have put mama in the middle because I'm a mama and I can just imagine how brokenhearted she would be. Klaus forbid her to talk to her, the left-hand side of the screen. They all were disloyal. His daughter, his two younger brothers by ripping them off of Hawaii and his two oldest boys were the golden boys. You can talk to them. Here's some of the news clippings of the day when they sued each other. It, I mean, the Kardashians have nothing on how these people were covering the newspaper. He gave the boys, his eldest sons, $25 million because he, he disinherited the younger ones. He says, boys, I now don't have anything in Hawaii anymore. Uh, no, I'm now is the time for me to pull those beet seeds out of my pocket and get cracking. I am going to put California on the map with a thriving sugar beet industry. We will compete with Europe. And these, by the way, this $25 million, Adolf put it, started putting, he didn't put the money back in the business like his dad thought. He spent it on horses up in Napa. And John spent it building a city down here called San Diego. And then Klaus recruited every single farmer in California to see who would be the lucky town to win a free refinery. And now this is when I fall in love with the subject of my book. He puts his broken hearted, his family is just torn apart. He puts his overalls back on. He's going farmer to farmer. I've got to make these farmers realize this is the way we can compete. We are a dry, brown, poor state. We're going to have to grow beets. I'll refine them. We're going to, the whole state will be successful. And um, through a whole series of twists and turns, Watsonville, California wins. Uh, the Pajaro Valley is teeming with beets. Another railroad he builds. Now Santa, and now we're going every which way. Uh, Watsonville, the infrastructure of Watson. I mean, we're talking hospitals and schools and people moving in because this is the most successful beet sugar refinery. He still has a San Francisco sugar refinery, but now he's doing beets on a scale unbelievable, 45 tons a day. Well, now America is paying attention. When Watsonville won, so did America, because now Klaus is now America's foremost expert on manufacturing sugar from the lowly beet. And states across America start pulling themselves up and starting these refineries. And he is mentoring everyone. 
And people are saying to him, a New York Times uh, journalist said to him, Klaus, you're 68. Why don't you just go rock, sit on a rocking chair at your home in Aptos? No, 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 no. It's not the money why I'm doing this. I got enough money. But I want the California to show that Klaus Spreckers has done something for this state when I die. Well, if that was too successful in Watsonville. He had to move down to Salinas Valley and he turned the Brown Valley green. He irrigated, taught farmers to irrigate. 30,000 acres up and down are now, are now planted with beets and he's refining them. I mean, it, I don't know how to tell you, but this is a success for a man. And just, he finally has realized his dream. And then in 1899, this Salinas Valley, the whistles blow, blew the whistle, that loud, one loud whistle. And now he's shipping granulated powdered liquid sugar on a massive sale scale across the country. It is unbelievable. And here comes another railroad now. I mean, he's built now number five. Who does this? Who builds five railroads? I'm like, this is crazy. But now people are going places, uh, sugar's in the car and passengers. It's pretty amazing. And when the Brown Valley went green, John Steinbeck's father was a wheat miller. There was no more wheat to mill because everybody's now farmers. So Mr. Steinbeck, senior, went to work for the Spreckles factory. And his son, the Nobel and Pulitzer Prize winning novelist, John Steinbeck, uh, went to work as a seasonal worker. And um, so all those books behind him, it's it's incredible. Um, all these struggles were that he saw on the Spreckles during the agricultural fields were famously chronicled in these books. To the left is a picture. I was at the National Steinbeck Center um, in July, July, July. And this man was waiting for me. And I he says, there's such a, a wonderful story, but we end up both crying at the end of the night. He's wearing his Spreckles sugar bag. He worked for 55 years. And this book at long last validated his entire career. And they, later on after, so he brought me people who worked the boilers. It was just a really sweet thing. Just sweet, sweet, sweet. Now see that little town up there on the right up there? That is my second favorite town in the world. It's Spreckles, California. It's still here, people. It's a time capsule. And that little company town of uh, Spreckles built for his refinery workers was the location for East of Eden in 1955. So there you go. You'll see here. Um, just to show you what it looks like today. There's 1930. There's the store. 1980. And there's this in July. There's the store today. These are pictures I took of below the store. You can just, it's, um, it's incredible. Um, Mount Monterey County. Uh, County gave it its historical designation in 1991. So you can do nothing to this place. Here's the little houses right here. They're just adorable. And Clout wasn't the company town where Spreckles owned everything. He gave it to the to his workers. He built schools. He built parks. He he they had indoor plumbing when no one had indoor plumbing at the time. And by the way, there people in Spreckles are quick to tell me that they saw the same plumbing system. So it's pretty amazing. Now let me point out. What I see, the town of Spreckles is a legacy. His legacy is here. It's an island today. It's encapsulated by farm fields today. He built a vast network that made the introduction to lettuce possible during the 1920s when it replaced the sugar beet. And today we know, I hope you know, the salad you eat comes from here. I always thank Klaus at my meals now because I love Taylor Farms organic salads. I'm going, thank you, Klaus. So it's the salad bowl of the world today. And few people know it's because that man irrigated 30,000. I mean, think about this. So 80% of the leafy greens in America are grown on his fields today. He goes back to Hawaii just before he died. He's now a loyal supporter of the monarchy. He's celebrated as this great entrepreneur. Just a wonderful picture of him at the end. Great stories about this time. Then, of course, we have this horrible San Francisco earthquake that happened. Klaus lost a lot of money in this. He lost his home. Um, 
He lost his business. Um, I learned a lot of horrific things. I have some primary source from a diary that's actually um, from one of his descendants is, um, I have in the book. It's pretty, it's pretty cool. Well, let me just say what we need to get, we need to get to this slide. When he was preoccupied building the the his beet empire, the Hawaiian Hawaii sugar industry, his former enemies, all those missionary families, they secretly, because they did not want Spreckles to know because their sugar refinery, Spreckles sugar cane refinery was still in operation. They overhauled a refinery in Crockett, California, and they were ready for business the day after 1906. And they called themselves California and Hawaiian Sugar, CNH. And they were able to start business because they did it, and the two eldest boys weren't paying attention. They should have seen the enemy coming per their dad. He was so upset, he disinherited his elder, eldest boys, and he reconciled with the youngest. Incredible. When Klaus died, there was hardly a household in San Francisco that his life did not touch. He was employer of thousands and a huge philanthropist that he didn't like to pass around. So there you go. We're at, that's his mausoleum in Cyprus. just little notes in this you know little things from his obituary reminds me of the age he lived in that age of blood and iron you know crude age age of grubbing and remorselessness money gouging and wealth getting but even his his his, his bargain said he didn't do that of course after he died the youngest ones sued the eldest brothers the wife died and in, in the midst of that other lawsuit, she was very, very, there was a very sweet love affair those two had with each other. Klaus and Anna Spreckles had a deep, deep, deep relationship with each other. She did not want to live after he died, to be perfectly frank. And then today we have Spreckles. See this clip art on this slide here? That's from a law school tutorial because you better know Spreckles be Spreckles if you're going to pass the bar exam. That's how busy they kept this, the, the courts. So even after he left, he lost a lot of money in the earthquake. He left behind 852 million. And because his boys did not reconcile with each other, that, that continued down the family wars. In fact, when John D was dying in San Diego, his brother came here to say, can we, brother, let's, you're dying. John wouldn't let him in the door. So I just wonder, what would the Spreckles name mean today had there been a re reconciliation? I mean, it, they went to extraordinary lengths to avoid each other. And when I went looking for the descendants to write this book, I never ran into so many hurt, wounded uh, stories from the descendants. It's just like, oh, the name could have been, it would still be a household name. So I'm it was been a, such an honor and a blessing to be the one that could write his biography as as full and and wow that it is because I want his name restored. And today I want to tell you I didn't even know this, but sixty percent of our nation gets their sugar from beets today. Uh, let's not talk about the unhealthy relationship Americans have with sugar. That's a whole other conversation. But we live in California. Um, so we get cane sugar. But if you lived in Colorado, you had beet sugar. So it's really interesting. But you know what? That's not his only legacy. His legacy is leaving something in people. And, and I have met so many descendants. I have them in a Facebook page. I have, I have um, hosted reunions. I'm still meeting them. I'm introducing them to cousins. And I have seen some traits that only they could have got from Cloud Sparkles. So that concludes my PowerPoint presentation. Woo! That was a whirlwind uh, of, of history. Yeah, uh, I'm, sure. gonna, I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna stop your share so we can see Thank your you. face. Um, there you go, and you're you're big sized again. Um, we're we're past the top of the hour, but there's still some time to say say a couple of things. 
Uh, first thing I'm going to do for everyone is I'm going to repost in the chat um, more information about you, how to get to your website, how to buy the book. You've generously given us a discount code, uh, 6BB24 for 50% off the book from the publisher. Um, you can go to the link that's in the in the chat or call the number. You said they're terrific to talk to on the mm -hmm. phone, um, which is great. Um, but I wanted to uh, ask a couple of questions about your um, your your research process, right? And how you use you said a number of times primary source documents and interviews and 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 conversations. Tell us about that and how you went about that for this book. Well, because no one's written Klaus Spreckel's story before. I mean, 1966, a guy named Jacob Adler did it, but he didn't ac have access to what I have in my age. But a lot of it, to be honest with you, climbing in attics. <laughs> yes, attics. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's also, it's going through making myself say, please trust me, descendants, trust me. You know, they're very private people all the descendants from the five lines to gain access to their correspondence, their trunks, their paper bags with these rare, I mean, you can't believe some of the rare things I found to make a story that's just not telling facts. I like to tell people, you know, the I'm a woman too, and I guess we, we women get a little, little um, emotive, but I really want to tell a, a holistic story about Klaus Spreckels, not this not this world's richest guy, you know what I'm saying? So that's mm -hmm. the sort of um, story in a primary source, a lot of newspapers. I worked with a genealogist and another researcher in Hawaii to help along the process, to make sure I was understanding. <clears throat> I've consulted people in the financial world, you know what I mean? I mean, this is a big story. And I had to work with industries in the shipping and the railroad industry. If I got anything wrong, I'd be crucified. So I paid a lot of independent people to read my research and to say, did I screw anything up? Tell mm -hmm. me. So that's the funnest part of being a nonfiction writer is the research, meeting thousands of people. So so what, what made you, you wrote the book on John Spreckles first, right? And then you decided to do the, what was, what was that like? What, what? made well, you want to go deep on on klaus after well the first two books all starts in an attic in berkeley and the stories in front of the book but anyways how it happened is is that john d spreckles book um was it's a pretty big seller it just went into audiobook but der spiegel which is a magazine in uh hawaii in uh, germany uh, they did a cover story on who is this robber baron in um, America. It's all in German. It's a pretty, it's got the, the largest publication in the world. I've come to find out. My publisher um, made it known, like Sandy, you want to write another book? You know, yeah, I could go write the contract on this because I already had a few books, <laughs> on them, right? So um, I went on an inspiration tour up to Northern California to San Francisco. Salinas Valley, the town of Spreckles, Monterey, Aptos, Capitola, meeting people, going to see, is there a story here that can sustain me? Mm -hmm. And that's what happened. So I decided, wow, this is big. This story is big, 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 big. Especially someone from me who really loves Hawaiian history and I'm mad that when I was in school, no one ever taught me the true story of how we got a hold of Hawaiian Island. So, mm -hmm. um, and who did it? So I'm not sure that answered your question, but nope, it it did. Uh, it did. I loved. I loved when you said um, there was a, a part where you called him either saint or sinner. Like you oh, decide, yeah. right? He was clearly a driven and ruthless businessman, right? Well, yeah. But like, why? What What do you think drove him to to be like that? Um, I didn't hear any early tragedy in his life, or you know, he clearly moved from Germany to America, but uh, what, what do you think was behind all of that that really drove him? He's a unique character. He's not like anybody I've ever read about. I mean, he, he's he's so unique. What You know, he, he's very clear about his motives and of course they're all really altruistic, right? But you know, mm -hmm. you know, there's 
it, it's and it wasn't for money. He had enough money. He could have retired in his 30s. It was always to to just go and it, and it was a ruthless error and he wasn't going to be held back. And mm -hmm. I think what drove him was a lot of it was for distraction too, as his family is falling apart. He was a close family man, close to his sons. And when they were all not talking to him and he was, especially with his daughter and they were suing each other, it's like, okay, I, if I stop building, I'm going to have to maybe sit back and think about what's happened to my family. Family. Yeah. Yeah. It was interesting because you mentioned like early on, he had a, a couple of breakdowns, right? Yes, he did. Did, did he have them late? I mean, because his life only got more complicated and crazy and dramatic. Um, did, did, did that happen? Did he have to take some time off and. Yes, he, he was at one time that, yeah, yeah, they, they hauled him out of San Francisco once. I think they, I think the, uh, the local doctor, their, his local physician, like tied him down to get him on the transcontinental railroad to get him out mm -hmm. of it. But he was not going to be uh, nurtured in America. If he was going to go and have, he wanted to go back to Germany. He only trusted the medicine of the times. Mm. He trusted the process. Um, where <clears throat> anyway, that's I cover that nicely in the book. But um, yeah, he did have a nurse breakdown. I don't know how Anna lived with him. Oh my gosh, she <laughs> put up with a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, he's so fascinating. A, a, a character um, in, in California history that I really didn't know anything about until we started talking and right. and and this presentation. Um, so for folks out there, we're going to, we're going to wrap up. There are some questions in the chat and the Q and A that I will share with you after this, uh, because maybe you can answer some of them and you can give me some of those responses and I can get back to some of those folks. Um, but I think some of these answers are in the book <laughs> and I, I know, uh, we could have you talk for hours and talk about the whole book, but we want folks to explore the book themselves. So it is in the chat. Um, how to how to buy the book, how to get to your website, find out more about you or to contact you. If you yeah, missed that, if I you like missed that in the in the chat or the website or um the website link or the the discount code, you can contact me. I'm Kevin at bccbooks.org. Mm -hmm. I can give you all of that information again. Um, but we are we are gonna wrap up here. It's about 20 minutes past the hour. And I'm gonna wrap up by thanking you. For this presentation, Sandy, this was so, so amazing. There's lots of really nice feedback in the chat, which I'll also share with you. Um, oh. And thanks everyone out there for attending this Book Club of California program. Yeah, Some appreciate great... you history lovers. <laughs> wah, wah, wah. <laughs> I, I told Sandy there will be a lot of history lovers here. So yeah. uh, <laughs> so thanks for, thanks for showing up. Uh, for this program this evening. It is uh, being recorded and it will be available on the Book Club's YouTube channel. So you can check it out there. Again, contact me if you need that link. I'm Kevin at bccbooks.org. Um, I'm also going to invite you to join us for our next program, which is actually this Thursday. It's unusual for us to have two programs in a week, but this Thursday, October 24th at six o'clock, we have a joint presentation uh, co-hosted by the folks from Litquake here um, at the book club. Uh, it's called The Forgetters with Greg Saris and Leslie Carol Roberts. So you can join us in person if um, you are interested in showing up in person, but you can also join us on Zoom. That will be at six o'clock on Thursday. Um, you can register for that event online at bccbooks.org slash programs or use the link in any of the weekly programs emails that you might be getting from the book club. So thanks everyone for joining us and for staying a little late uh, this evening. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your evening. Be well and take care of yourself and we'll see you soon. Thanks. <laughs>